We're going to talk about now funding programs. We've learned that, first of all, my name is Carl Kalbacher. I'm uh, with the Ferguson Group, and we're under a contract with uh, the city of Harrisburg to help out with uh, this program, and we appreciate the opportunity to be here with you. And um, so you've learned about the uh, Geology 101 or Karst 101, and, and now uh, we're going to transition to talk about uh, possible federal funding programs to assist when uh, these karst issues come up. And uh, with us today from um, the state of Pennsylvania is uh, Mr. Tom Hughes, who uh, serves as the state hazard mitigation officer, and he's been there since uh, March of 2010. Uh, the uh, SHMO, or SHMO? SHMO. Uh, he is the uh, principal staff assistant to the bureau director and the Pima director in hazard mitigation matters. His office is charged in the oversight and execution of six open FEMA hazard mitigation disasters under the Hazard Mitigation Grant, which is a federal program, and 30 FEMA non-disaster hazard mitigation grants uh, that uh, are offered uh, by the federal government. Uh, his office oversees uh, operations in all 67 counties, uh, 14 Pennsylvania state systems, um, and um, their project activities have included uh, home acquisitions, demolitions, home elevations in floodplains, small structural and flood proofing projects, acquisition of generators and notification and warning systems, Mr. Hughes is the co-chair of the Pennsylvania Silver Jackets program, which is involving all levels of government uh, in professional association dealing with uh, emergency management. And he was voted in 2013 by his peers, by his peers, to the uh, national team. Uh, and with that, we'll uh, turn it over to Mr. Hughes. the podium here, so maybe I will have to. All right, um, I got some handouts here. If we can get the next slide. I want to make sure that you guys go away from here with the information that I wanted to make sure you had. Uh, there's uh, several programs that FEMA has under the Hazard, Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program, and some of these grants we'll, we'll touch on here. We're not going to solve everything today. Uh, I want to make sure you had the, uh, the grant guidance. There's an there's a, a information brochure that they'll be handing out to you. You should have the uh, PowerPoint slides now, so you write and take notes there uh, as we discuss things. I uh, also have the Pima letter of intent. Say the city of Harrisburg wants to submit an application. There is an application process for that, and I'll go over the timelines for that. And then uh, also um, at the end of this, uh, um, the, you guys have flooding here in Harrisburg. We. Uh, <laughs> Under the PA Silver Jackets program, we actually put a brochure together for residents, for legislators, things to do before, during, and after a flood. And, and the team, actually, the toolkit that we put together is actually being used across the country right now. So um, I, I encourage you guys to, to go to the website and, and use that. All right, so we're going to pass the handouts in out after. Yeah. Sure. Well, you can do it right now. I, I don't mind if, if there's paper shuffling while I'm, while I'm talking. That's, that's fine. So. It's a working meeting, right? right? All right. All right, if we can hit the next slide, please. Okay, I, I wanted to give you some, uh, some information on other sources other than us, uh, you know, Pima and, and FEMA. I wanted to discuss with you today the, the uh, funding streams, possible funding streams, and then highlight uh, mitigation funds for, for specifically for the sinkholes. Um, highlight impacts being called into Pima. You know, the city of Harrisburg is not the only jurisdiction that's dealing with sinkholes, and I'm sure other speakers have talked about that. Bill, you're going to be talking about it, right? Okay. We, we, we did a, a, a session with the, at the, this year's emergency management conference uh, that all the emergency management uh, coordinators came to and their staffs. And one, one we highlighted on was, was sinkholes, uh, uh, just, uh, just landslides, yeah, there was another one, Washington. Uh, so, you know, this, this is coming to the forefront here, the sinkholes. And I wanted to use you guys as some advocates here getting the word out on what are some possible things that we can do for, for sinkholes as far as funding streams and that. So next slide. Okay, uh, 
our, our sister uh, agencies, uh, DEP and DCNR, there's a link that you can go to, a useful site on, uh, on sinkholes, anything you want to know about it. All right, next slide. And, uh, you know, Bill, you're going to be talking about your involvement, DCNR's involvement. Oh, you already did? Okay. Sorry, I missed it. I was late. So, um, yeah, we're uh, here to talk about that and uh, talk about the, the funding, or lack of funding, I guess, for sinkholes. All right, next slide. How many of you are aware that there's a hazard mitigation plan that the county has to submit to FEMA? Have you guys participated in it? Okay, especially if you're elected officials, you're going to want to be part of that. Uh, every five years, the county goes through a hazard mitigation uh, planning process, and that plan then needs to be approved by FEMA. And if you're going to get any FEMA dollars uh, through the hazard mitigation plan, the hazard mitigation activities for the jurisdiction and the actual plan itself has to be adopted by the jurisdiction. So, in this case, City of Harrisburg, you adopted. Uh, you know your plan's you know good right now. Uh, if you want to submit an application, you could do that. Okay. But here, uh, I wanted to show you, and we we, we took this off the DCNR, the, the map on where uh, the limestone and the sinkholes are, uh, and you'll see in the next couple slides here some of the. Um, places that we run into into the problems that we've got call-ins through our emergency operations center on hey what are we going to do now so and this is it this is their plan and there's also a DCNR I don't know if you talked about it, the interactive map they can go to uh, there's the, there's a link if you wanted to do that once you left here okay go ahead Lebanon County I get a lot of calls from the Palmyra era area and uh, so I thought I'd show a few, a few slides here where you know, we got some problems, um, you know, high density areas where you know, people are living here that uh, we've got sinkholes that, you know, the, the homes are in danger. This is uh, uh, October 11th, 2013. All right, next slide. Uh, next slide. You can see it, it happens anywhere, anytime. You know, here, here is in the, in the winter. Um, go ahead, next slide. Again, Palmyra uh, Borough. Is it here in York County? Yeah, this is uh, this is submitted by the by the Planning Commission. So we get emergency management, we get the Planning Commissions, conservation districts, you name it. We get the calls uh, on on sinkholes. All right, next slide. Northampton County, rolled on one. Um, you can see the foundation uh, problems on the right here, uh, right right in our backyard. Uh, and so you remember seeing that map? It goes all the way up through right up to, to Northampton County, the, where the limestone's at. Okay, next. Adams County. These are new, Bill. I didn't have these pictures. So um, we've got the Conewago Township in Adams County. And I think uh, in that slide there, you can see the initial repair to the cost was $36,000. Okay. And one thing with the sinkhole is once you go ahead and fix it, then we're worried about is that going to re reopen. So um, just throw money at it. Uh, and here's another one here. Uh, between New Oxford and Hanover, Adams County. And again, roadways. So it's not just you know houses, we got infrastructure that's, that's affected by the by the sinkholes. All right, next slide. This was an interesting one that I, I dug out of uh, like Homan County, where uh, next slide please. Uh, or even since it, like Agnes, okay, they have an area, um, you want to hit the next slide on this, um, where there's actually a an area that's flooded when we have large rain events. And also, if there's a thunderstorm, say, miles away, it channels into this area underground and then bubble, bubbles up. So there's a, a constant problem right there in, uh, in Brady Township. Um, let's see if I can see the, there should be a church on one of these slides. I guess it was on the, can you go to the previous slide? Okay, this is an Agnes. If we can go jump to, to two more slides, that's the same building there. Okay, and again, here we were in, uh, in Irene and Lee, where that same building was affected. Okay, we didn't have a whole heck of a lot of rain in Lycoming County. About half the county got, got flooded. But where the water came from flooded into this area, now we got a problem here. And you know, we gotta check and see whether that's in a special flood hazard. We're gonna talk a little bit about that on whether that home that structure would be eligible for us to actually entertain that with FEMA dollars. Alright, next. Okay, with any of the FEMA funding. Uh, like say I'm going to do an acquisition uh, elevation of a home, it's got to be voluntary. I can't go into a to tell a homeowner you need to be acquired 
or you need to be elevated. Okay, it's, it's, it's voluntary for the, the individual, but also the entity that, that needs to submit it to the municipality, who's an eligible applicant. So th there have been times when municipalities have told me that they didn't want to entertain an application, and that's okay, it's voluntary. It does take work. All right, next slide. Okay, where does my money come from? You know, just, hey Tom, we're gonna give you a couple million dollars. Uh, actually, it comes from uh, the, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program was, was created by the Stafford Act. Okay, but if I'm going to to open that up, I need a presidential declaration. Okay, uh, if that doesn't happen, there is no funding. There is no mechanism for that funding to come down to me. And what happens is, um, have you guys are you guys familiar with the Public Assistance Program, where they fix roads, bridges, and that FEMA does that? Okay, they, they take a they they look at the total there for does that declared disaster. Then also those homeowners, the individual assistance that comes from FEMA, there's also a pot of money that goes to those folks. So whatever that, that dollar figure is, the estimate is, I get 15% of that set aside, not of that pot, in addition to that pot that I can use under the disaster program. 15% is what I can get, okay? And, then, and for Irene and Lee, our total that we received was around $68 million, okay? So we put a lot, of, we're doing a lot of work with the $68 million. Okay, and again, the overall goal is to reduce vulnerability to natural hazards. Sinkhole a natural hazard? Yes. Yeah. All right, next, uh, okay, and FEMA provides 75%. Of that, there's also a non-federal share. On the, on the disaster side, the state has kicked in traditionally you know, 22%. So then a 3% needs to be made up by the local jurisdiction. And there's different ways to make up that 3% cost share, but I won't go into that you know, at this time. All right, next slide. Here's uh, the laundry list of what's eligible under Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Again, this is the disaster program. And you should have that, that on your slide. What do you think the number one priority for the state is under disaster um, mitigation funding? Acquisition. Why would, it, why would I do an acquisition? Why would the state want to entertain an acquisition? Well, when I remove that home, what's our risk? Zero. Downside is, you know, you, you may lose some tax base there. So, but again, zero risk for the homeowner being there, zero risk for the first responders ever having to go in there to get somebody. Okay, so that, that's number one priority. Uh, of that 68 million, we're, we're doing a couple elevation projects, but most of it has been acquisition demolition. Okay. We have done some notification warning uh, up in uh, Cameron County, in one of the dams, they have very bad, uh, uh, like telephone coverage, cell coverage, um, so there actually affects two counties. So they're going to go ahead and 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 put the, the sirens all the way down through the valley there to, to help those folks. So there, there are like we did an ice boom that breaks up the ice in Oil City. There are not a lot of neat projects we've been able to do under the hazard mitigation grant program, and we're, we're doing some flood uh, And the county plan actually received money through this program here, and, and it will again for the next update. All right, next slide, please. Again, what is, what is mitigation? What does it mean to our <coughs> program? How's it mitigation is any cost-effective action taken to eliminate and reduce the long-term risk to life and property from natural and technological hazards, okay? That's, in a nutshell, what hazard mitigation is under the, the FEMA program that I, I implement. Okay, next slide. And I don't want, I, I don't want to confuse you guys. There's, there's three different grants here and I'll work with the or whatever, whatever municipality on which grant program is the best for best fit for them if they wanted to send us an application. Does that, I remember I said a disaster declaration, hazard mitigation grant program, 15% of that pot goes towards that. That's a disaster grant. What do we do when we have blue skies? Should we just like stop doing work? No. We have two non-disaster grant programs that we can work with. Pre-disaster mitigation, and flood mitigation assistance. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. Okay, here's our objectives. Again, prevent future loss of life and property, provide funding, and to implement, most importantly, your, your, your county and, and local plan here on what you wanna do. What are your risks here in the community? And so we try to put that to work. Okay, who's eligible? Uh, state, county, municipal government, and certain nonprofits. We don't have any recognized Indian tribes here in the state but uh, they're also eligible. So, you know, everyone, you know, those type of entities are going into that pot. All right, next. I mentioned that the hazard mitigation plan. First and foremost, 
what FEMA looks at is to see whether you have a current plan. Now, if you don't have a current plan or your mitigation action is not identified in that plan, does that mean like all, all, all comes to a halt here? No. Uh, we did about 14 amendments for Irene and Lee. Uh, there were some jurisdictions that wanted to get a generator. That was not in their, their mitigation plan. There's some that did not adopt the plan for whatever reason. We were able to get the adoption done. There are some that uh, just didn't have acquisition and demolition in their, in their plan. So we were able to get that work with FEMA and get that added. It takes a little work, but we got it done. All right, next slide. And here's our state mitigation priorities. We mentioned acquisition, demolition. Small structural projects, those would be like a box culverts and that kind of type of thing that you say public assistance goes with the big dollars. We have small you know, like, uh, drainage uh, pro projects we can do. Um, we can also uh, use the state initiative uh, on, on this one with generators came out. We're actually using 5% of the disaster funding to help communities for emergency operation centers uh, for uh, critical facilities get generators under, under 5%. And then I mentioned that Dolphin County was able to use some HMGP funds. We got 7% uh, here for the, uh, for the plans that, uh, to help out the county plans, home elevation projects. And then businesses are kind of lower on the totem pole. And I can tell you why. Uh, there's other, other grants and, and funding that's available, like small business associate, uh, administration, those type things. So uh, we try to help out the homeowners, get them out of, out, of, out of harm's way first, and then look at the businesses. Okay, I mentioned the, uh, the, the cost share 75-25, and we can use in-kind match on, uh, on, on any one of these, these grants to make up uh, the cost share. We, got it. we have to have it identified. We've also done some neat things though where we've used public assistance funding, uh, the various sections 403 and 407, and uh, NFIP, what does that mean to you guys? National Flood, National Flood Insurance Program, right? Okay, we, we did so, uh, some neat things here where we use our increased cost of compliance trying to stretch those mitigation dollars for other homeowners so we can bring them in. Uh, if we can use the public assistance and the NFIPs increase cost compliance, we can uh, pay for the cost of the demolition, therefore reduce their overall budget, move that money, slide it over to somebody else's project. So we've been able to do that. And then we're working with, uh, where's Larry at? Is Larry Belmont here? Oh, Larry, there you are. Uh, we're, we're working with DCED. Uh, on the have a community development block grant, the disaster funding, we actually put together a package for DCED uh, that we we're going to run under hazard mitigation grant program to use it towards that 3% global match if we're able to do that. Remember, as I mentioned, there's a, a cost share. FEMA has a way that you can use that funding to use that as a 3% for the overall money that I'm spending in disaster funding. So there's different things. We, we've got pretty innovative on, on trying to stretch our dollars here. But uh, I understand that Dauphin County also received, is that right, Larry? Direct CDBG-DR funding? Yes. yes. Okay. Them in uh, Luzerne County, I think, right? Right. Okay. That was under Irene and Lee. Okay, next slide. Uh, Pre-disaster mitigation. I was talking about blue sky funding. This is a non-disaster time, okay? There is a, a, a cost share there. 75 is paid for by the feds. 25% is, is non-federal share. Okay, on this one, non-disaster, the state does not put in any money towards the non-federal share. Okay, this is all uh, local. Okay, again, it's still, uh, we have to run a benefit cost analysis. Uh, we still have to uh, make sure that's in the plan. On this one, though, this is nationally competitive. You saw with the disaster fund we get, the state pretty much says where we're going to spend those monies. Under the PDM and the next one I talked about, flood mitigation assistance, that goes out nationally. Now we do have, a, the state team does meet. We have like DCNR, uh, uh, DCED, DEP, PEMA. We all sit and we look at, at the, uh, the applications we get in and do the prioritization for the disaster. We also do it on a non-disaster, but then it has to go through one more hoop. We got to send that through electronically to FEMA. FEMA Region 3 down in Philly looks at it and then they submit it and it goes through a national competition. So. Out of the funding last year, I think PDM was somewhere around 62 million. That was a total pot under uh, FMA, I think it was like 89 million. Uh, from what I understand, they're trying to move up the timetable on the non-disaster non applications for this next year. Usually it's uh, April, the last two years has been April. There's talk that they're gonna move this one up to January, January, February, so um, Ms. Powell's gonna have to submit applications pretty pretty soon if they're gonna do that under, under these two, under the uh, non-disaster programs. 
All right, you do get points there uh, for uh, uh, community rating system, and I think Harrisburg is one of those communities. Uh, good on you guys. Get a, a reduction in your N NFIP uh, premium for your, your residents. It's nice. Not all communities do that. Okay, flood mitigation assistance, that's the other uh, non-disaster grant that's funded through the National Flood Insurance Program, also nationally competitive. Severe repetitive loss uh, properties. Those are ones that receive uh, quite, quite a few claims in a 10-year period. What do you think that, that house on the right costs? That house was actually in four different pieces. That cost me $270,000 on, on an elevation overall cost. This one right here kind of looks you know, simple. This is down, at, both of these are down in, in, in Norristown uh, uh, Township in uh, Montgomery County. That one cost me 240000 so some of these are not cheap and they're pretty involved. So, you know, for me, elevations, I spend more, I have more headaches from the elevation projects. I got about 180 projects going on right now in the state uh, under these various programs. And the elevation ones take up more of my time. Okay, what's not eligible? Uh, repair or replacement of existing infrastructure. Okay, if you had a maintenance issue and then try to tag it as a disaster, it was caused by a disaster, that's gonna be a flag. Okay, I can't do bridges, you know, Tom doesn't do bridges. Uh, debris and snow removal, I can't pay for that under hazard mitigation assistance programs. And uh, anything that public assistance uh, could pay for. You know, we usually have a pretty good, when we had the Irene League, we were actually, stuff that looked like it would be public assistance, we would ship it over to the, those guys and see if they could fund it, get the sign off, and then come back. And any, any deferred maintenance. Okay, how would we get sinkholes in, in, these, in, these fund, in this funding? Wow, okay. We've got an issue there. Repair or replacement existing or recurring problem. Does that happen with sinkholes? Yeah. Mm. I'll read something though that it might be some good news, all right? Uh, proving that the event actually caused this issue. Was it Irina Lee that just caused a sinkhole? Was that sinkhole there before? Hmm, we're gonna need somebody to sign off on that. Uh, legal and or insurance issues. You know, do do people, folks have clear title to their property? They have mineral rights. They just came, FEMA came out with a mineral rights policy. So we gotta look, look at that. I need an engineer sign off. I need somebody saying that there's eminent danger, that we've got a problem here that maybe the homes will fall in within in five years. Okay, municipal and homeowner pre-award resources. Some of the folks do some engineering before they put it for, for a grant. Would that be eligible? May or may not, depends on when the application period was open. Uh, can the whole process be completed with the FEMA's period of performance requirements? The next state over, we had Sandy, right? Pretty bad. Notice they were talking about how the funding wasn't getting to where it needed to go. So they came out with the Sandy uh, Reform uh, Improvement Act. Actually, they upped the time, you usually have three years for a project. They're, they're actually taking a year off of that, and sometimes they, you know, I only have 18 months for the award. So that's one of the things we got to think if we got an application, we got it in, we got it awarded, can you complete it in 18 months? That's something you got you to think about. Can I get extensions? I've gotten extensions before. I've gone to FEMA and said, look, this is just not possible. You know, and I've, I've gotten, at, right now, it used to be I could, I could do it to go to the region for a three month extension, a three month extension. Now I have to go to FEMA Region 3, they can okay it. Then it goes to headquarters. So, I mean, that's out of our hands here. So, you need to think about, can you, can you do a project within that time period? All right, next. I mean, a danger definition. Uh, we're using the public assistance of, of, of five years. How about substantial damage determination? Have you guys gotten into that at all here in the city? Okay, homes at 50% uh, or more fair market value, the damage. Okay, sometimes after a flood, you know, your floodplain manager should be going out and, and doing that. Um, you need to look at your orders to see what you, what you have listed there. Okay, are all sinkholes in the floodplain? There's a lot of them there. All right, and so that flood mitigation assistance program, we talked about severe repetitive loss properties and that. If it's not in the floodplain, I can't do anything with that grant. So, one more thing. Benefit cost analysis. You got engineers in here, right? Does that mean anything to you? Benefit cost analysis, you're probably with the core. FEMA has their benefit cost analysis. I'll be talking a little bit about that too. Uh, landslide e e equivalent, found out that for sinkholes just yesterday, that I need to use that landslide. 
Remember Bill, I was talking about that that'd be the way I might do it. Now FEMA is telling me I'm going to use that that benefits cost analysis uh, methodology. Damage frequency. I was worried about this. You know, sinkholes. Do I need to have every event on on a structure? How would I do that? Damage frequency analysis. You know, has that been documented? I find that it's really hard in, in flood damage properties getting claims and all that information, the background on what's been spent. Okay, next. Benefit cost analysis. Pretty much what FEMA is saying is for every dollar we put in, we want to get at least a dollar out or more over over in a, in, a, in a lifetime. And for acquisitions, they look at 100 years. For elevations, they're looking at 30 years. So there's actually software. You want to hit the next slide? Um, here's the, actually, I, I gave you guys the definition, you know, the one for one. We have to have a ratio 1.0 or higher. And let me see if I, I got the, uh, go ahead, next slide. Okay, um, but we, we have to look and see whether that ratio, when we put it in the software, that we get that 1.0 or higher. And once we get awarded, if there's cost overruns that takes us above that 1.0 or under that 1.0 ratio, that's not good. Okay, so we need to make sure we have a tight benefit cost ratio that we've, you know, pre-award costs, legal costs, all that within, within the application. New thing came on the market uh, last year, FEMA came out with a cost benefit memo. They looked at what, it, what does it cost for, for homes across the country. And so if I can do a home acquisition for 276000 total project now, and like say I had five houses, 276000 allocated for each of the houses in that, in that project, I don't need to run a benefit cost analysis. I can just use that memo, and that's been the easiest. I tell you, on the 10 flood mitigation assistance grant program, or flood mitigation assistance uh, grants we did last year, we used a memo on it on every one of those. So, um, many many sinkholes and mine subsidence events occur outside of floodplain. So, again, I can't I can't use it for flood mitigation, but I might be able to use this 276 under the pre-disaster mitigation or hazard mitigation grant program. So. Um, we, we need to find out where, where those homes, if you want to do any kind of application and acquisition, we, we have to find out where they're at. This is just, a, I want to give you guys a handout um, on the calculations here. Can you read that in the back? <laughs> no, it's, it's, you'll, you'll get a copy of it, what's included in the uh, in the landslide uh, calculations here. And here's the, the other thing now, um, FEMA added to help us out, I think, um, the social benefits. You know, somebody is, is scared that they're in a floodplain, that their home's going to be damaged. There's actually a, a risk factor, a social benefit factor they've now put into, into the program. So we've been able to, if, if they're close, if they're like 75%, we need to, you know, get it to 1%, 1.0. There's, you know, things that we can do. Next slide. Should be environmental. Environmental benefits, too, now they're included. They never used to, both of those were not included before. So if we got, we're close, they'd say a, a, a 0.95, we need to go 1.0. This may put us over the top, so that helps. How do we apply? How do we get that money? How do you get in my my wallet? No, I'm just kidding. It's not my money. But uh, how how do I get the money? Would you think that being a state and being federal dollars would be an application process? I know. You, have you all bought a house before? And how thick was that paperwork? triple that, all right? I'm just telling you that, you know, when you entertain an application, there are going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of paperwork. Okay, um, we have a pre-application document. I actually brought one here today on what starts the process. I, I need, need folks to be very specific on a document. We want to do an acquisition project. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, we're going to acquire one. What area? You know, that kind of thing. Be specific so we can look at it. Uh, we will send out an application packet by uh, electronically if uh, we believe it's eligible. Remember, I had the, the list of what's eligible, what's not eligible. We do a pre-screening because we don't want to. None of us want to waste our time. If it's not eligible, why go through the application process? Okay. Um, the HMGP disaster applications. I need to make sure they go to FEMA within a year of the disaster deck. We don't have any disaster declaration right now. I do have six open disasters, but all applications have been submitted under that grant program. I mentioned that this, the non-disasters will open up in January. Once that happens, there's a 90-day period that we have to get those screened, state team meets, and get them into the system to FEMA. Anything outside that box, you're looking at the, the following year. So there's a 90-day uh, limit there. 
And I put down three year period of performance. I don't know if that's a guarantee anymore because they're trying to, as I mentioned with Sandy, trying to uh, accelerate the, the process for, for their, their funds. Okay, here's our, our new webpage. If you haven't been to it, recommend going to it. Um, we actually, I, I'll give you the links on how to, how to get there to get the electronic form. Uh, how many municipalities do we have? We City of Harrisburg, any other municipalities here? Okay, so that would be sort of where you would go to, to get that on, on our website. All right, next slide. Or right, is FEMA the only funding source that's out there? Okay, Larry's gonna probably gonna, yeah, Larry's in the, yeah, yeah, FEMA's the only one. <laughs> Larry, we're your flat jacket, right? <laughs> Now, he, uh, there are some other funding streams that we've worked with before, um, and I wanted you guys to go away with that on, you know, things that we, we've done. And also, say we acquire land, what do you do with it now? So I've got a lot, a lot of that from the municipalities on, here's some options and other funding streams you might want to look at uh, for land that's been acquired. One, I, I can say <coughs> when we do acquire land from FEMA, it's deed restricted. And again, it's got to comply with uh, FEMA's uh, 44 CFR Part A. What does that mean? It's their open space requirements, okay? So can I put another structure on that? We, you know, we just bought it, why would we do that? So, you know, things that we have to get Mother May, we do a letter to FEMA saying we want to do, put a parking lot or whatever on it. Okay, next slide. Here's my point of contact. Bill, I want to make sure you were there too. <laughs> uh, Dan Fitzpatrick also, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He uh, deals with, the, he's the NFIP, National Flood Insurance Program Coordinator. Um, he, we work with, with them quite a bit regarding uh, the, the floodplain determinations, or whether uh, certain homes qualify. And then I also talked to, to Hugh yesterday at PennDOT. Um, they, they have a program uh, that, you know, for roads and that. And I guess that comes out of liquid, liquid fuels funding. And so I thought I'd put that number up there for you too. So you have roads that were affected by a sinkhole. So I think that's the last one. Okay. I know, I know that was a lot of information. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a lot of questions. Okay, so um, so first of all, you said that there has to be a declaration in order for this has already happened. So you, does there have to be a declaration of a? There has to be a declaration that's open to submit an application. That's why I'm saying that for Irene and Lee, that train has already left the station. We've got everything in and oversubscribed, just in case uh, under my program uh, for disaster grants that I, I actually oversubscribe. Knowing that I only had 68 million, I've got other ones that if somebody drops out, I can move them up. I have to have all those applications in to FEMA, which I did by a certain de uh, deadline, and it got those in. Under non-disaster, there doesn't have to be a declaration. So for this event, even though it's already happened, we're right. talking about pre-mitigation. We're talking about something. We're talking yeah, about hazard mitigation, mitigation grant program. Yes, okay. a disaster grant. Okay. The application needed to be in um, like two years ago. No, no, so we can still apply for has for, for the people on 14th Street that's already happened. No, what I'm saying is that the money's already spoken for. Oh, okay. See, that, 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 that's a question I have. I mean, you know, that's, sinkholes can be covered under leak troubles or leak. Right. If, if the sinkhole had manifested itself within that one year period, otherwise, I mean, if, if we went and studied, we've had people come and say, uh, red, I'm sorry, residents who have said, you know, th this property runs along Snake Creek. Snake Creek used to be 50 feet from the road. Snake Creek is now five feet from the road. Um, you know, nobody nobody could have foreseen uh, this at the time of Storm Lee. So, I mean, is there any, where do we go? And that's why I say, because they have such an accelerated timeline, you're right, I mean, you may not have known that you had that sinkhole issue until say two, three years, four years down the road. And that's my problem though. I've got to have the applications in. And so now, um, say another disaster, you know, happens, you know, you guys might want to look at that. Say, okay, with the hazard mitigation grant program, if you got time, if you don't. I think we're, I think we're leaning towards the pre-disaster mitigation if we were going to do it. So um, unfortunately, because there's a, uh, the cost share is different. There's only 3% under HMGP. Under PDM, you know, it's going to be 25%. Okay, so, so continuing the question. So the, the homes that are remaining, we could apply for pre-mitigation because technically they could, something could happen to them. So we did that. Uh, this is what I got from, uh, from FEMA last night. Up until this point, I really had a, an issue with you know, whether I could even get it under sinkholes. Remember, Bill, you remember when I was talking to the emergency management coordinators. 
This is what I got from FEMA just last night. Acquisition of sinkhole threatened structures under the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program would be considered eligible for review. Suboptimists would be required to test the structures within five years of imminent collapse due to the threat of sinkhole hazard. They would be able to obtain this determination by certification of a state or local professional geologist or engineer. If they choose to hire a professional ge uh, ge geologist or engineer to make that determination, the cost for those services would be eligible for the project. Okay? The rules changed yesterday. Okay, and it, does that include um, relocation or just acquisition and demolition? That would, if, if you put it in the application, that would be one thing that we would put forward too on, let's look at relocation. You're saying relocation of the structure? No. Families. Oh, family. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's covered. Uh, okay. um, I shouldn't say that. Under rental assistance, uh, if they're a renter, it's covered. Since it's voluntary, though, homeowners will not get the relocation costs. Yeah. But they would get, but, but, yeah. but they wouldn't get the relocation costs, but we would be able to acquire those homes. You would be able to acquire those homes, right? Right. Yeah. The, the reason that the, re the rationale was that you're a renter, you didn't have any any say in this. You know, the, they voluntarily bought the house, you know, now, and so now you're out. So they would pay under URA Uniform Relocation Assistance. They would pay that. But a homeowner didn't know either. Right. <laughs> a homeowner wasn't in for this either. Right. Well, I think I think what we're saying here, though, is if we can cobble together the different grant programs. So don't so don't not to worry yet. But if we could get some money for the acquisition, for the you know the the um, site prep, and then we would find other monies for the relocation costs because there are other pots. And I think that's what we're talking about. Right. Just trying to put it all together. So I'm trying to find out what would be eligible under his program, and then we would try to look at the other the other funders as well. That's correct, and, and we have done that where there's been, you know, the, the feds don't consider the uh, community development block grant funding as federal money. Once it hits the state, that's local and state money. So it's not commingling of federal dollars. So you're right. There'd be a way that we could we could try to try to work something. Okay, another question, sir. Um, I just want to make a comment about the uh, definitions that you're using. Uh, a lot of sinkholes are, aren't in a floodplain. Well, what's happening is when you get a threshold rainfall, say maybe three, four inches or whatever it's going to be, each, each car system has a limit. And you're essentially flooding the karst aquifer that generates all those sinkholes, even though they're not in floodplains. But it is flooding underneath. So if Bill and his group can start looking at, and, and in the Lehigh Valley, we found there's a very stable threshold of one, two inch rains, three inch rains, and there's a tipping point at which everything goes to in the handbasket. So the, the data is there to create that, that definition of how sinkholes are related to these extreme precipitation and weather events because uh, the aquifer underneath is flooding. The second thing is the, the, trying to fund all the losses after it's happened is just, you know, We're the cost benefit, right? right. So pre hazard mitigation uh, could, could be done to take vulnerable areas. Uh, and again, you have to come up with rational criteria, but that's something the municipalities and their engineering people and the state can do. And then finally, um, once, you, once you understand your risk areas, then you can start um, uh, the, uh, uh, this, the mitigation avoidance part of it, you know, through your pre uh, mitigation hazard. Uh, uh, pre disaster mitigation right, funding. Yeah, and, and, and the cost benefit to that is 10, 15, 20 times. So that money will go so much farther if you do it up front. You're talking loss avoidance, right. That's right. And, and then insurance companies have created a special category for themselves because they'll cover certain things and not other things. And ultimately, there's an ultimate cost to everybody for, for this, you know, these events. And so if they're not going to cover this, they should be kicking in a little bit to the funding for Pima or somebody. You know, there are ways to gr grab, you know, collect funding from different sources that should be used for pre-hazard mitigation. Now, if they want to cover the loss, fine. But I wouldn't say it's a tax or anything, but it's like on your telephone bill. You have all these excise charges and stuff like that. Hotel bills have them. You know, so 
what I'm saying is we don't do anything like that for this critical thing that affects all of us. So, right. so a little bit of thought like that. Uh, yeah, I just can't, you know, it's going to take legislation or whatever, you know, and, and an insurance company to go along. On, on, on your second item, though, I, I, or was it the first one, on dealing with the, the floodplain, I'm a little concerned about that, though, because if you try to put someone in a floodplain, you know what that's going to be like. I mean, you're going to hear it. You're, you're hearing that the premiums went up, and now if I try to map somebody into the floodplain, but I, I think your rationale, though, on the loss avoidance is the way to go. We can put that, and remember I was saying it was nationally competitive? That's the stuff the national teams is looking at. What over time? What what is it going to save us by doing so? Just one final comment. I think it's time for you to start telling the feds how it should be done, but versus the other way around. That's why I got this. I think, and I think some there's some other people in the back of the room too that were helping out. Which this is we it's a big problem. And I had to say this can't be a Pennsylvania problem. That's right. Florida, Georgia, you know these other states also have this problem. So I think that's why they came out with a policy statement last night. So. Any other questions? Go ahead, sir. Tom, a little self for you. To be clear, FEMA has never used this money for this before that we know of, right? We have not in, in, in a state that I'm aware of. Uh, and it's competitive, so not everyone get, is going to get this money. Right, exactly. There's a cap? Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about the cap. It's, it's $3 million. Now, that's per project. Okay, that's not per, per state or anything. Unless they, you know, they can do that, they can change that, too. I haven't even got the, the grant application requirements yet. So I don't know what, what's happening next year. But you're right. Three million, you know, and I've done that. Uh, we had a Apache uh, planning we did under PDM. When I went and put it in the system, it seized up because it was over three million for the planning for the 14 universities. So we were able to break it up over a number of projects and get it to go within the system. So yeah, we would work it that way. To follow up on that, so if you make a determination about that we're going to take the house, how is the value turned over? Um, this is something I got to check on because for, for flooding, we look at the fair market value pre event. So, had that not been affected by the flood, we have to have an appraised value by a state certified appraiser. Not too sure how they would do it for sinkholes. That's something that wasn't in there that I would have to find out. Let, let's say everything works out. We, we get, you know, everything goes perfectly. What do you think the time frame between today and when people could actually have their homes? Here's how it works. All right, so let's go with the, the non-disaster grant. You know, which I, you know, we were looking at PDM. I think that's more realistic if we were going to do something like that. We, we're looking at a timeline. If, if they open in January, and I'm just this is hypothetical here. All right, <laughs> don't say Tom Hughes said. <laughs> looking at January, 90-day application period, usually six months for FEMA to actually look at the, the project. Uh, and have their national review team. They'd like to have a technical review and then they have another review. And then we would say maybe January, February next year <coughs> it comes out to the municipalities of that following year. Then we're looking at we have to do all the paperwork on what's the, you know, to make sure all the appraisals are there. Um, we have to have a grant agreement in place with the municipality. We're probably looking at a year and probably a year and a half. But best, all things being, you know, working. Best, best case scenario. Best case scenario, right. Yeah. And to be clear, the money that the homeowner's going to get may not cover their mortgage, for instance, what they own. Exactly. We're dealing with a lot of um, foreclosures, that type of thing. You know, people are, you know, have two, two mortgages. You know, that, that happens. And so we try to work through that. We work with the SBA to where they've done some uh, loan forgiveness. So that there's, there's different, each, each person, has, each homeowner has a different circumstance and we try to work through that.